Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, we ready? You guys ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. These are the dates. Oops. I think, I think we're on. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> to the uh, Tuesday, November 13th, regular school board meeting. Um, may we all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, item one, any adjustments to the agenda? I do have one. Okay. Um, under the um, approval of the um, extracurricular personnel nominations, um, we need to uh, remove uh, Joey Doan Jr.'s name, five tenths middle school indoor track assistant coach. Um, we learned that this position wasn't posted, so we need to repost it and go oh. through the process. Okay. That's all. Okay. Any other adjustments? Nope. Okay. Uh, moving on to approval of school board minutes. Uh, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the school board minutes from the regular business meeting Tuesday, October 9th. Uh, 2018 and emergency board meeting Thursday, October 11, 2018. Second. Any discussion? We should probably note why we needed to have the emergency board meeting, which is in regards to the minutes of the regular business meeting of October 9th. Mm -hmm. And the reason is uh, on the agenda for the 9th meeting under um, extracurricular high, uh, or what's the word, not extracurricular, but um, uh, oh, stipends, and was uh, an actual hire um, teacher. of a teacher that needed to be uh, voted on separately of the stipends. And so on the uh, 11th, we met and um, held that vote for, someone can remind me which teacher, I'm drawing a blank. French teacher. French teacher at the, French middle, teacher at the middle school. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Moving along to comments by student representatives. Hi. Um, so in the past, like since we've met, there's been a lot in terms of um, extracurriculars and sports. Um, so we had a very successful year for fall sports teams. Um, the girls uh, soccer actually won state, which was super exciting. Um, the boys made it to the semifinals. Regional finals? Yeah, regional finals and came in second. And then volleyball was runner up at state. So a pretty exciting year in terms of athletics this fall. Um, yeah, and also um, I know we've had a lot of clubs going or um, that have been starting up recently. And so we've been seeing a lot of like new interesting things. Um, just coming up and like new things that people are interested in. And so I think it's really cool to see that and like the school um, expanding kind of um, in the things that we're focusing on. And then beginning of next month, we have TEDx coming up, which is a really exciting event. Um, and that is December 7th. So we're looking forward to that too. Great. And involving the whole school with that. It's gonna be really awesome this year. Julia, what are some of the examples of the, the new clubs? Um, well, one big one is the Yellow Tulip Project, which is um, one of the clubs that um, it's like um, mental in, from, for mental illnesses and mm -hmm. spreading the word about that. And um, um, youth activists. Yeah, the youth, that's a bit big one that's started in the school recently, and it's really big on social media right now. Um, so they're doing a good job, like spreading on Facebook or um, um, mainly on like Instagram and stuff like that. They, I know they have like a lot of the school following them now, and so they're spreading some really good messages and stuff. And so I think that's really cool to see. Does anybody happen to know what the the tagline is for it on Instagram? Or? Yeah, I um, think it's Yags Active. Youth Activist Group. It's like. Yeah, Youth Activist Group, YAGS, and then it might be CHS. Yeah. I can check. I'll get back we, to you on that. I will yeah. find out yeah. what it is. Thank you. 
Thanks so much. Thank <laughs> um, next, any comments from the public on agenda items? <laughs> nope. <coughs> All right, seeing none, we're gonna move on to presentations. First, we have Peter Esposito here with us. <coughs> I'm here tonight just to ask um, for our, our high school to be removed from the National Scrum Program. And there's a few reasons I just got candidates um, at each year's stations. One, one of the reasons um, we, I've had some students come to me and ask a lot of questions about why food is different, why, why um, the portions are smaller and all that. Also, we've had some administrators ask um, if we're singling out, you know, free reduce kids. We don't do that. There's no way to do that. But also, in order for them to get us to get reimbursement for that, they have to have a complete meal. And that's with anybody that gets a, a full lunch. For us to get reimbursement, they have to have three to five components on their tray which one of them is usually has to be at least a half a cup of fruit. So that's the easiest one to put on a tray as they're going by. What I've done with, um, we've had surveys and then we've had advisory groups have given us a bunch of information. What's happening is a lot of that food is getting thrown away. Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons we'd like to remove from the program for that, but also it'll give us more flexibility to get back to what, when I started here 10 years ago, we revamped the whole program. We went to a more from scratch program. Um, now it's getting harder and harder to make those recipes work with the current guidelines because of sodium levels, um, calorie content. Um, but for instance, we have, we have uh, macaroni and cheese dinner. Two thirds of a cup is a serving. So we have football players or, or even some young ladies, the two-thirds of a cup of macaroni and cheese is not gonna cut it. So we have full salad bars. I've got pictures of the salad bar that is exactly what it looks like every day, only it's long, I kind of squeeze it on my page, but they're allowed to get anything they want off that, but we also have to have certain things on there, like the greens and all that. Kids just aren't eating it. They're throwing it away, we're wasting money, um, and we're losing, we're losing counts. Um, as far as people buying lunch, and we're losing all the sales. One of the things our program was self supporting from the time I was here until about 2013 or 14. You'll see in the packet we never received um, any, any town subsidy whatsoever. Um, we were able to support ourselves, that included salaries, um, benefits, equipment repair, some equipment. We were able to do that out of our own money that we generated. Now it's it's non-existent. Um, if you look, I have a slide there that has um, financials from one of the, it was like the second or third year that the guidelines were relaxed until the last, the final rule, which you can see the difference in other card sales of about 100, over $100,000. So we've lost that. Um, so the past few years, we've had to get subsidy from the town, which we hadn't in the past. I have no budget, because um, we've always been self-supporting. So what I'm asking is not to change, to sell things like soda or candy or anything like that. I think the people that know me, how long I've been here, know that the integrity of my program means everything. So we want to be able to sell a full-size bagel or make our soups from scratch and not have to buy something and sell it as frozen to eat it up. Because basically how I feel these guidelines are doing is almost forcing you to buy something frozen and cook it. And we have not done that and don't want to do that. And um, we'd rather make everything from scratch. We have one of the biggest farm to school programs, one of the first um, that we do. And we have to also be mindful of what we serve there. Um, we've been getting it from Caitlin Jordan down the street for you know five or six years now, and before that, Jordan Farms. Um, the cost is a little higher, but we believe the quality and being in the town, we would rather do that. This is something that I'm afraid that I'm not gonna be able to continue 
if I have. We have to keep on the same um, path. Um, so what I've got is I've got a few examples of some products. Um, you see a Cheeto. It's oven baked. It meets the guidelines. <coughs> I don't care for the product. It's got artificial color. But Donna in front of her has, well, actually, hold up the other one. That's an organic RX bar. There's four ingredients and it's 210 calories. Does not mean we cannot sell that. But that is that is cinnamon a toast crunch? Cinnamon toast crunch that meets by the USDA guidelines. So this is what we're facing. Um, so it's almost like they're forcing us to sell this stuff because it meets the guidelines and they formulated it to me. Whereas some of the other stuff is just kind of common sense. So um, we've had multiple, like I said, with the, with the students, one of the, some of the comments were um, the portion sizes are small. We've got a smaller. We've had in the back there's a survey that we did with just some simple questions on how it's changed over the past years from when the guidelines were first introduced to now. And you can see that the decline and <laughs> everything. Um, the needles, that's another one. They shrunk. We, you know, we've got, we don't have this anymore because we can't. Last year, there's a few items that um, we got dinged on, which were a whole wheat. It was a wheat animal cracker, but it didn't say whole wheat at the beginning. It was only 100 calories, but it didn't mean because it didn't say whole wheat. So we also had formulated a chocolate chip cookie recipe that was whole grain when the guidance line started changing. So it was 51% whole grain. Great product. We made it in house. And last year, now the calorie count was a few calories over. We have to reformulate our recipe again. So when we keep doing this, we're lo every time we have to do this, we're losing more and more business. So um, I just would hope the board would consider this. Um, like I said, I wouldn't sell them candy or anything like that. I want it to be what it was five or six years ago, what we were able to do. And we can't do Chef of the Month anymore because none of those meals meet the guidelines. Um, there's a lot of things. We can't, can't do base sales if, as part of this program. So all these things that supplement different clubs and sports, we, we, we would have to do something else. So. Do you mind bringing in the perspective around um, stigma around free lunch? Lauren, I think at some point Julia Baker might have some interesting things for the board to hear as well, whether it's now or when it, yeah. at the business part of the agenda. Um, so, I mean, I wholeheartedly support this proposal. Um, I've, there have been definitely increasing complaints, concerns, um, whereas in the past, I mean, I think our, our lunch program was probably the best in the state and was acknowledged with some awards and that sort of stuff. In terms of stigma, the reality is that for students who buy lunch in the school, they're virtually all buying a la carte. They're going up and buying, going to the deli bar and getting the made to order sandwiches, which are really, really, really popular, but the lines are really long. Um, or they're buying a, a sandwich and some chips or something like that. Um, so that is the norm, or students bring their own lunches. Um, it's really exceedingly rare for a student to buy the entire sort of entree meal that's prepared, which in my view, is it really does a disservice to the students who have to eat that meal because that's what's required for free and reduced lunch in order for the cafeteria program to get a subsidy for it. Um, so I think that really does single out in a way that is unacceptable. Um, you know, in a different community where there was a significantly higher free and reduced um, population, perhaps that wouldn't be as much of a big deal. But the idea that students are avoiding um, healthy lunches altogether um, to avoid that stigma, I think, is really, really not a message that we want to send. Does 
that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. So also, I just had to run some numbers um, just quickly. For the subsidy that we would lose, we have, um, we have the lowest free reduced that we've ever had since I've been here. It's, we have 46 free kids and like 10 reduced. Um, and of, of those, we're only having roughly five kids at the high school, <coughs> five free, four reduced. So basically, it's like $28 a day that we would be losing in subsidy. And that's it. We, we get the lowest amount of subsidy for our high school program than the other two schools. Um, so basically, if you add that up over the course, that's what we would need to make up. And I think we could do that with just being able to sell our regular bagels that we that we had. So I don't think it's a huge amount. And I think we could do a better product. Yes. So uh, this sounds like it's all headed in all the right direction and for all the right reasons. The, the only thing I would um, sort of ask, and you may already have an answer, is when you see things like um, federal standards being uh, pushed aside, um, part of that is to give people some comfort as to what they, um, that someone's sort of overseeing and looking at those type of things like nutrition. So um, I think often more appropriate is to ask um, you, how do you measure yourself and what you put out there and how, so that people who are interested in the nutrition <laughs> and what you're putting out there, that they have, can have confidence that, that it, is, it, 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 it is what it appears to be. Yeah, so, so when you're putting together, you, you, do you have something that sort of measures or looks at how you put your menus and, and nutrition together that is, well, that, the that you, that that, that, yeah. Get some feedback from the kids. Yeah. I mean, I have teenage kids too, so I kind of know what they, what they like to eat. But also, you know, especially um, here, um, kids got, they have trained palates. I mean, so they need something, and I come from a restaurant family, so I know, I know what, what it's good to, be, to eat, and I mean, obviously. Um, but we have, years ago, we were able to do, you know, our spaghetti sauces. I mean, we still do that, but we have to watch exactly everything, the sodium content, and it's just not the same product that we were putting out. So it's it's disheartening because, like, like Jeff said, I mean, we were in magazines before and everything for what we were doing, and I had people from California calling and asking for recipes, and now, it's, it just seems like it's all phenomenal. So, so I, I, I get that. The, yeah. These things are barriers that you have to try and steer around. And I'm you know, very supportive of I guess what I would say is when you come out the other side and, and, and you're back where you say so you want to be, where you've got that kind of, yeah. is thinking about how you might want to re report and portray that so that people have that level of nutritional confidence that they've sort of already sort of. Right. Uh, um, you know, the things, the things that we have, we used to have what they call a 5% rule for all snacks. Mm -hmm. It had to be 5% per 100 calories and any vitamin and mineral. It's kind of a broad, broad spectrum, but it's also gives you a little bit of leeway with what you can do and what the guideline is. With this, now it's so cut and dry, it's 200 calories or below, and you see that it's just, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. But I want people to see what we had before, you know, when we had all of the, the, the huge salad bars and the different salads when we put out the salad bar. We can't even put regular parts of salad out anymore because it has to be whole grain and the kids do not like that. We've tried every product there is that they sell and they just don't like it. I mean, I have kids of my own, I've tried everything, my wife has tried to, it's just the way the products are, it's almost like they're forcing you to, to buy these products that just aren't great. No, I, I get it. N yeah. No one wants a menu filled with oat pucks. <laughs> but I guess what I'm saying is I'm very encouraging. It sounds like you're headed in the right direction. I would say when you get to the other side, think about how you want to report on what you offer from that nutritional point of view, since, since a federal standard that you're sort of now complying to goes away. Right. Well, I, I don't know how I would be able to measure that other than that, I mean, like I said, the integrity of the program would stay the same, um, only that we would have some relaxed guidelines with some snacks and um, certain meal items that wouldn't have to be whole brain for everything. Heather? 
Um, so I have a question. This is just uh, <coughs> being brought up for the high school. Can you speak to why it's only the high school and you're not considering it for Pond Cove and the middle school? Because I think the high school kids are, are young adults and they can make good decisions too. Um, the, the younger kids, it's not such a problem because we have kids that eat lunch and our numbers are good and they're, they're buying them the product. So hopefully once maybe they get up in the high school, maybe it'll be different then. But right now, I mean, we have kids from two years ago that don't eat lunch anymore because of the guidelines. So we're just trying, we're just trying to tread water and trying not to cost the the town a ton of money to keep the kids happy. Okay. I have a question for you, actually. So when talking to the students this past week, they talked about like some of the price increases. Is that because of the like decline in the amount of lunches that people are buying causing the price to drive up, or is that just? The products are more expensive. Okay. The whole grain product is sometimes is 15 to 20% higher than it is for the other product. And it's, it would be okay if people were purchasing that stuff, mm -hmm. but when most of it's going into the trash, it's, you know, it's just wasteful. So would prices stay relatively the same way they are now if it went down? Okay, I was just curious. Yes, sir. Um, I just need some clarification. So you're presenting to the board to see if you want to introduce more type of food to the cafeteria. Is that right? Not necessarily. It's removing us from the National School Lunch Program. Okay, removing from the National School Program. Okay. And just running so independently. The other question that I have is <laughs> how much have you involved the students to uh, make the menu? How much have you got the students involved in this process? Because well, they're ultimately the customers, right? Right. We, with my fourth grade classes, I've had coming in do culinary class. I've had kids that have done uh, for harvest lunch. I've had kids in the cafeteria all the time. And then I also coach baseball, so I had a lot of kids. I didn't have it for a couple of years, but I had kids always telling me what they wanted to eat. Okay. And do you have anybody from outside? Who, who does possibly do an assessment of our existing food? An assessment? An assessment, yeah. Yeah, we have the state. The state, okay. Yeah. And I've talked to a lot of students this week um, just talking about their input on this whole issue, and I was shocked with the amount of input I got because usually my advisory doesn't really care about much we talk about, but they actually sat down for like more than a half an hour discussing all this stuff. And they were just talking about, I talked to one kid and he actually buys three lunches a day because the portion size is just too small and he just gets starving after. Um, and then more of them would like, because with the lunch, you get a, you get a milk with the lunch, don't you? Well, you, get, you have to have three or five components. And yeah. one of them has to be at least a half a cup of a fruit or vegetable. That's yeah, true. so a lot of them were just suggesting alternates for the milk, like having a little like pull and spring water bottle and stuff like that. But I was like, that's not, you can't do that right it now. Credit yeah. On the tray as, as a component of the Exactly, launch. and that's what I explained. And also, students were really taken away by how we would have to take away bake sales because that's huge revenue for every single club in the high school. And those are something that I think is really valued at the high school and kind of a privilege versus the middle school. Like you're in high school, you get to do bake sales. I think it also kind of brings the school together in a way. And I think by taking that away, that would not only take away from the clubs at the school, but also just kind of the dynamic and the privilege behind being in high school. Can I ask a follow-up question about sure. that? So how long have we been, does this mean we're not in compliance and we've been selling oh, bake? We're in compliance. Oh, the but the, sales. with the bake sales piece, like <laughs> we've been doing that. I, I mean, I've seen him. Not in compliance. Yeah. So that either needs to stop or we need to pull out. Yes. I mean, that's pretty clear. Yes. Okay. Kimberly. Um, so I think uh, Justin Alphon was here a couple weeks ago speaking to us, and I maybe misheard, but it sounded like there may be some other um, towns in the state that have pulled out, or? Falmouth has, uh, Cumberland has, um, Noble has, um, and there's more to come. And um, can you speak at all to their They experience? have the same issue. Um, 
some of these programs were successful and like I can speak for Falmouth because she actually came here to visit and modeled her program after ours. Um, I had a school board contingency came and visited with their new hire and you know she came back and basically mirrored me for a few days and went to the high school and set up her operation very similar. And then when these restrictions kept getting tighter and tighter, um, they removed themselves and um, they had they had more free reduced than we do. So basically they had to eat the cost of the meal because we still would offer our free reduced kids to free reduced. But it was so minimal with what she was able to do at the other end. Um, and there was no, you know, she was serving same, the same foods and some of the snacks that are still smart snack compliant, she was, she's still selling, but there's a little bit of a leeway between 10 calories or something like that. I mean, that it, it's just getting to the point where I think a lot of directors in the state are feeling the same. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hope. Um, so to John's point, during our policy committee meeting, I had the same concern that, you know, what happens sort of from a, um, um, uh, you know, what does this look like that we're taking ourselves outside of the federal guidelines, but um, it should be noted, and then this was raised at the meeting, that we have our own district nutritional policies, and we have requirements around not serving minimal nutritional value snacks and exactly. I, in my mind I thought oh you know, this means there's gonna be soda machines in the in the schools but that's not what this means we have our own policies they've always been there and they continue to be there right. this is just taking it off the federal sort of layer that's right. created this these artificial restrictions so to me that was very reassuring that I think it's it's something right. so I mean there's there's that <laughs> I mean, it would never get to that point where I had to be looked up by the policy but there's all there is that policy that's right. there, which we were in compliance with 10 years ago, and now, you know, we still would be. No, sir. Sorry. So, question two for you, Donna, maybe. Uh, so, if you pull off the, the national program, does that mean we had to bid with three with bidders uh, for RFP this this program? It becomes privatized. Come privatized. The current, no. Same program. Yeah. Same program. Under, so if you our department, yeah. under our department, it just would not be part of that. There oh, do you mean so, have another company coming so, in? Yeah, so we yeah, have no. two schools who are basically following the national standards. One school is going to be not following the national standard. Right, and you have the same vendor doing this. 20 years ago when I worked in South Portland, the high school was not part of the school lunch program, but they had six other elementary schools that were. So you can do that, you could have- You can mix you match. You move one school and have, as long as, when I do my paperwork, I don't add them into that. So we're not getting any subsidy for it. We can run it independent. But okay. it's still as a department. Okay. Um. So bringing back Mr. Alfon, who is here, he was uh, talking to us a little bit about uh, his program, Full Plates, Full Potential, yes. which we are uh, interested in perhaps pursuing a little bit more. And how would that play in? Because I think he would work with you, I obviously. Spoke, I went to Augusta and spoke as the uh, DOE asked me to go speak with Justin Alfon last year up at the State House um, and talk about my backpack program and my food bank that I have in Scarborough. Yeah. So I spoke with him and the, the full plates thing, I mean, I read and I actually applied for a grant a few years back. Yeah. But um, basically it goes by your free and reduced population. Um, and we got denied. I did get one, I did get $2,000 in Scarborough, but my was like 20% free and reduced, whereas here we're at 3.4 now. Right, but if we pull out of the national lunch program for the high school, does that jeopardize the work we could potentially do with full plates, full potential? For which school? Well, I guess for the high school, since that's what we're talking about. Um, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't see anything in the grant form, but I'm pretty sure that we probably wouldn't get any grant money from them, as I got denied before. Okay, so in order to be supported by Full Plates, Full Potential, you... It's, it's more for at risk. No, I, I understand that, and they determine at risk by if you are receiving funds from the state. Yes. It, okay. It's really usually your free and reduced rate. And our free and reduced rate is so low 
Mm -hmm. But we do have the application, so if you want to look over it. Okay. Yeah, I printed that off so you could see, because like I said, I had done it before, but it was like I didn't even get a, it was basically just a no after when they sent it back. Okay. Because I actually had applied to get a salad bar, a refrigerated salad bar mm -hmm. for our middle school in Pond Cove. We have one there, but I had applied and I didn't get it from them. <laughs> and, you know, they do good work and they give a lot of grants. But it's, it just seems like it's a lot for ones that are h higher risk. It, it just seems like the information we received mm. um, it seems a little contradicts that. Um, because they came to speak to us wanting to support us and wanting to help make it happen. But maybe I misunderstood. Be more than happy to talk to him. Yeah. OK. I, I have a, uh, oh, sorry. With John, I think John and Elizabeth. I was going to just comment back to what you said in terms of our own food policy. What I was suggesting is sort of after this is digested, we ought to think about some sort of annual reporting that makes visible the good work that you're doing that shows here's, we do comply with these policies, here's what we do. Um, because it is an area of particular interest to people and the policy sits in the policy book. But if you're actually reporting against policy, it's quite helpful to, and visible to people to see that, particularly when you're st saying things like, we're not going to follow the federal standard anymore, for good reason, but because you're, we're saying that, where do you go to sort of read about, here's what we are doing? And reporting uh, on a periodic basis against our own policy or whatever uh, other standards we're using, I think could be helpful to everybody. <coughs> Elizabeth? Kind of similar to what John is saying, um, I think that we should have, you know, banners and posters and that sort of thing. We've won awards. We've, you know, we were in magazines, all this stuff. That should be advertised in the cafeterias. People should know that. It's, it should, at the time, I remember it was a point of pride. And so um, I hope, you know, if we are able to go forward with this, we can kind of return to, you know, those fantastic soups and, you know, your family, you know, marinara sauce and the, you know, where people are coming from all around to try to do that. And then, <laughs> but that we can, that we can celebrate it. And then the kids know about it and the families know about it and they feel proud. Um, so that was one comment. And then, Yeah. yeah. I, I, I echo that. It's, as a way of communicating, not of say, not of a compliance burden. Mm -hmm. So, but in um, in another conversation, because it's it's um, unfortunate that we weren't able to have this um, conversation together when Justin was here and you were also here. Um, my personal wish is that we could all work together toward um, helping students who are food insecure to access that food. And my understanding is that, and, and I would love to learn more about Full Plates, Full Potential, potential but it sounds like that program particularly leverages um, the free and reduced lunch program and nothing else. And so um, I'm hopeful that we can work together and employ other strategies beyond that very restrictive program. We do have, and we actually, um, we have a backpack program that we're starting here where we're having a food bank that would be, but what has happened is we've created the account for it. So I've got somebody from Project Grace that's gonna be coming that I work with in Skyro that's gonna be um, doing some solicitation of some donations and stuff. And actually they wanna help on King Elizabeth now because I work with her quite frequently. So we wanna bring that over here too. That would, that would cover anybody in this less red tape. There's no paperwork to fill out. If someone's in need, no matter if they're free to reduce or if they're just in need, we would give them food for you know the week or whatever. We're doing that now, so that's something I would like to do. Um, and we wouldn't need to worry about the free to reduce counts. Mm -hmm. It's just something that we would do as good neighbors. That's great. No, sir? Yeah, a question. Um, what's the typical price for lunch? 325. And what would be with the new with the new program? 325. It would be C25. Yeah. And who monitors the prices and how long the was state. that? Who? The state. The state? Yeah. Okay. They so you. how much we can serve okay. lunch for. 
And if we go above that amount, we have to apply for a waiver. Okay. Uh, this is my question. Good. Thank you. Um, I just, I just want to backtrack just a little bit, so I'm more clear in my mind when people ask me about about this. So, um, if I'm reading your uh, information correctly, from 2000, 2009 to 2012, you said we received no money from the town, yeah. and so now we we do receive money for the from the town for the free and reduced school budget. The transfer from the town is like I think that year that I put in there was one of the first years. It was eighty-seven. Or fifty-seven thousand, or whatever. But yeah, and that's and that's because the um, the that's because the requirements increased, or, or the yeah, they, restrictions. What what they did is they started in two thousand ten. Obama signed the Healthy um, Hunger Free Kids Act. Mm -hmm. and basically, what what that was was these guidelines were um, incrementally. Set. I mean, it was said that in 2011 and 12, they were much more re relaxed. Mm -hmm. So in 2012, which I have there, I mean, we still, we did well. And it was still, the guidelines had changed, but it wasn't like we didn't have to have meat pizza go all for every time. We didn't have to have everything be whole wheat at the beginning. Of, so I mean, since then, yes, it's going to, and kids just need less of it. Okay, so so if we uh, remove these requirements because we we stop um, following the guidelines, um, you still feel confident that we, at at the price you just quoted for lunch, are going to be able to carry the the kids who have free who receive free and reduced lunch. Yes. Okay, um, and then. Um, my other question, it's not even a question, it's more sort of to the addition to, you know, eventually I want to go back to promoting and advertising the successes, go back to hopefully once we get back to that. Um, but I think inherent in what some people have already said, especially around no stigma, we want to be able to increase the number, and I know you do too, the number of kids buying lunch. And Can so we I have it in smaller schools, but. And I know in the survey you, you started touching upon that, but that would be something I would really want to you know dive into to see like okay what what can we serve that will make you want to buy because the more people buy the less people are going <clears> to <throat> notice who's buying it you know so I mean there's, there's some things that I know will change right away I mean we can make you know decent pizza and not have to worry about what we're putting on it for toppings and you know have because we used to do Greek pizzas and all that and we, we just can't do all of that now because it's outside of the realm of the guideline. And then the kids who um, currently receive free and reduced lunch, if we go, if we switch, mm -hmm. how does the process change for them in terms Not of payment? Do they have a different card? Do they have the same card as everybody else? No, we still have the POS system that has it on, on there and nobody, nobody they knows. go through and they either put in their code or whatever. It's just like every other kid. Okay. Nobody sees anything. Good. Sorry. Elizabeth? Uh, so to our student representative po representative's points, um, if we pull out of the um, school lunch program, that would that allow a student who's receiving free lunch to not have to take a milk. Maybe that person could have a water yes. or, okay, okay. No, sir? The, the funds that goes, he says that it goes from the town. Does it go from the school budget or does it go from the town budget? The school budget. School. The school budget. So, if the, as you know, the school budget sometimes in challenges. If there was ever a challenge, what would that mean for you? Do, are you running everything based on that? Money being available to you, guaranteed? No, I never am. I'm not guaranteed any money. Okay. So that's how I that's how I run the department. But when it ends up at the end of the year, that's unfortunately what's had to be happened. It's a transfer. But didn't you say? Can I? Can sure, I confirm ahead. something? Didn't you say that you think it's going to be easy to make the money back up just by even selling bagels? I think so. Well, for for the what we're Losing for reimbursement. Right. Yes. I mean, it's like twenty. It's like forty dollars a day or something like that is what we would be losing in subsidy. And that's it. So. Oh, I thought you had said twenty-eight. Twenty-eight Perfect. for lunch, and it's like I think fourteen for breakfast. Okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. I have 
a question. Um, so last spring in the high school, I know we were having like the food and someone coming in to like look at the food. So they took back a ton of their products, got rid of well, the bagels, everything. It was. When I went in there, there was stuff that wasn't compliant. Yes, yeah. and I remember everything being taken away. It was a very big deal in the high school, and kids were just like, every day for those like month, kids were just like, I'm starving, I'm starving, I'm starving. I was like, yeah, I know. Hopefully we'll make it right. So are those, would those snacks that they take away af go yes, into I think effect? Because like the bagels? Pretzels, pretzels was oh, one. Oh, yeah, that's um, been a big deal. I saw deal. in one of you guys' advisory, Pretzels was one that they we couldn't sell anymore because the bag it wasn't whole wheat. It was a regular pretzel. So and those were things that we used to we sell a ton of pretzels. Yeah. So we had a, we lost that. One of the other things was the 16 ounce pint the pint milks. Mm -hmm. We can't sell those to high schoolers, but they could go and buy two of the small ones. But they won't let us sell a 16 ounce pint of milk. Why is that? Why? Because That's it's all the size of them. Oh, too well. many calories? Is that what it, they're thinking is? Or? But then they can come in and we can't stop them from buying three or four of them. So it, yeah. just, it makes absolutely no sense to me in that aspect. Um, so, I mean, we've already eaten like our milks and all that stuff. Our, our chocolate milk is skim, is, is fat free. Um, we have no high fructose corn syrup in anything. We've taken out artificial coloring out of everything in our elementary school and middle schools. So, I mean, I don't think there's anything at the high school that it has coloring that's artificial. But like if you see the Cheeto in there, the, I don't think I even sell those, but they have artificial coloring in it, but that meats, because it's a bait. A Cape Cod chips don't. <laughs> oh, Kimberly? Could, um, could you just explain a little more the thinking of um, <clears throat> high school only, not not um, changing things for the elementary middle school? Because I think the, the loss in subsidy, the high school is the lowest amount that we get because most of the kids that are free or reduced there, they don't, they don't use their, they don't use it, they don't buy lunch. So you think that it would be too great a uh, financial yes. cost to make up at the elementary middle school yes. if we pulled yes, up? Yes, because the, one of the biggest, the Pond Cove and <laughs> the middle school are our biggest amount of free or reduced. Yes. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and so we heard from Jeff that Jeff is very much in support of pulling out for the high school. And I'm just curious if Troy and Jason are great with not pulling out for Pond Cove and the Don't middle school. <laughs> uh oh. Did I just open a can of worms? I think that, I mean, I think my, what I would just say, from my perspective, I think the middle school gets some. They all just go through the line, they kind of grab a tray, they, there's much more, I think they're more involved than they just go through the line and grab lunch. My experience having my kids go through at high school, they just were not going to do that. They'd bring their own food or they would go um, somewhere else after school and get it. They have much more access and they're much more mobile. Some schools have open campuses, I don't know about this high school. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of different factors at that level. And, I, and to me, the stigma is much, I don't really notice it at the middle school at all because so many kids are all kind of eating. Um, I just think there's much bigger involvement with the participation rate at the middle school and what I can imagine high school would have. I think, I think it's all about participation rate as far as your funding and your reimbursement goes. And I think that depends, and that I think directly correlates to the signal that's associated with it or not associated with it. So I don't really feel like there is a big signal in the middle school. Once you get past kindergarten, um, it's seen a lot of kindergarten students bring lunch. I would say the majority, uh, but just the kids love the food. So, so yeah, I, I don't see that. That's a whole different world. That's, the, that's the same with homes too, by the way. What's that? That's the same with homes as well, dinner table. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it seems very successful. Many, many students um, getting hot lunch and excited I know cheesy bread, bread was always a big thing <laughs> in our house. John? 
just want to close the loop on one thing. When, when Justin Alphon came and spoke, um, he was talking, I think, about a couple of different things, mm -hmm. um, not j just mm -hmm. the leveraging of the free and reduced lunch subsidy programs. So, and, and part of the appeal from what I understood he was saying to CAPE was partly because our participation, our, our num numbers are so low, we could set a very aggressive goal of basically saying we can get feed everybody and just have it be zero. There's no hunger, I mean, really, and, and set an aggressive goal because of our positioning and that there were multiple programs, both behavioral, nutritional, and other grant ones beyond the one that they were that mentioned that was leveraging that. So I just don't want that to get lost. It sounded like there were several things, and so I'd encourage you to keep keep looking at that and and think about how, because of where we are, can we set an aggressive goal, well, goal like that. I'd love to chat with them and, and see exactly what, what he meant with that, because I just know that that grant, yeah. the full plate with that one, yep. it's not, I know I had applied for it before, but if there's something else out there and we can get some money, of course, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> well, Peter, thank you so much, and I think this is uh, an excellent um, suggestion, and we'll, I believe we'll look at it shortly, and um, thank you for all you do. And I, I hope you get to get set free <laughs> at the high school. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving along, our next we have a presentation from, um, from our SRO officer who will be back momentarily. Um, in the meantime, I thought I would read something that hopefully you'll hear. Uh, but maybe I'll just, should I just wait? Right. He'll come back or does anybody know if he's coming back? Jeff, Jeff, do you want to talk about Officer Galvin at all at this high school? I can. He comes, okay. Oh, okay. Do you know how hard that was for us to time? <laughs> yeah. Hello, welcome. Yes, I'm going to introduce myself. I know some of you. Uh, my name is David. I'm David Galvin. High school, they call me Officer Galvin, and the middle of the school is Officer David. Um, I've worked in Cape Elizabeth for eight years. Five of those years, I was a community liaison officer. Um, I worked with the elderly in the community, and I also worked with, with schools. Um, when I first got the job as a community liaison officer, there wasn't really a big um, police, not police presence, but we weren't really that involved with schools. Um, but I enjoy having fun, and I like working with kids. And so I made it, <clears throat> I made it more school than, not community, but I was more involved with schools. And so I made it a point to hang out in schools all the time and speak with kids and have opportunities in the hallways to come across a group of kids and start the conversations. And um, so I did that for five years and then the opportunity came to, for the school resource officer position and I applied for it. Happy that I got the job. Um, and this year has been, so far it's been really, really good. I've had a lot of fun um, and I'm into having fun, like I said, and so it's, it's worked out. Um, I'd say last year was probably the best year I worked as a police officer. Um, working with the schools, I participated in Chewanke. I did that, um, I had a group of kids and it, I had a blast, like it was so much fun. And I hope this year I can go again. Um, we have a brand new chief, so hoping he gives me the permission to go. <laughs> but um, other than that, I mean, everything's been going very well for schools. I hope I'll be back for the principals here, but I feel like everything's been going good. Um, I try to, when I got the position, I try to make it business as usual, by letting the schools handle whatever they handle. If they need assistance, then I'm happy to assist. But I'm not the, I'm not the officer that's going to go in and. You know, be like kids need to pick, you know tickets and this and that. Like I'm, I would rather um, any the least police presence or the least police involvement with students is the best. Like as long as you know kid does something that they need help in, I'm happy to help, happy to assist. But I, I try not to. Um, I try not to have me as a police officer like being there and hurt this and that and that. So um, pretty much what it is. I am like I said, very happy. Um, looking forward to the years, and that's all I got so far. Any questions? No, I got some questions. Uh, welcome, and uh, 
just like to ask you some typical questions. Were you in uniform at Chiwangi? No, I was not. Good. So when I was in okay. Chiwangi, I was just going as a chaperone. I wasn't, I mean, they still called me Officer Dave, but I wasn't yeah. Officer Dave. I was, I didn't have a weapon on me. I was just okay. ready to chaperone, and oh. I, was, I was camping. I don't, I never camped before in my life. I'm, okay. I have, I have wow. Are you a mainer? <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm from California. Southern California. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not an outdoorsy person, and so it was, it was, it was the perfect, <laughs> Like I said, the weather was awesome. There was no bugs. So it was beautiful, oh. and I'm glad because I've never slept in a tent or had to use the facilities outside. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you will, um, can you describe your typical day? And also, within I know year is not long. What accomplishment do you think that you have accomplished? You could be bringing a smile on a kid's face. You could be stopping a kid from something. So. So my day, I don't have a typical day. I have stuff that I have to do, like I have an advisory group. So um, myself and uh, John Holdridge, we have 13 students that we are their advisors. And every day we meet from 10.35, 10.40 to 11.10. And they come and then it's kind of like a study hall. Um, they come in and we help them out with if they have issues with homework or anything like that. Not that I help out with homework. That's not what I do, but um, just just having conversations with them, and, and uh, so that's what I ha like, that's what I have to do. I do that at the high school. Um, I also do the lunch duty at the high school, so I help out with lunch. Um, and other than keeping, I check all the doors, make sure doors are locked, make sure everything's secure. I also do that at the middle and elementary school. Um, but tip, I mean, there's no typical day because I could be doing something at the high school, and then Mr. Eason needs me for something, so I go over there, and then. Um, Jason, I can't say his last name, that was probably. <laughs> 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 so I'll go help him. You know, things like that. So, so just there's typically like I don't really have like a like a schedule where I'm I'm at the schools, but I'm not like it's hard to, not, I'm saying it's not hard to find me, but I have I work at all three of the schools. So it's, are, you, are you done now, sir? Yeah, just part. one small question for do you visit the small kids? Kindergarten kids? Oh, yes, for schools? yes, oh, yes, yes. And I and I I, I used to say I do it for ego purposes because walking into the kindergarten wing with a uniform, yeah. it's awesome. It, like the kids are like, oh, Mr. Dave, and I'm high five. It's, it's so fun. So fun. Yeah, or lunch room, or yeah. It's, I mean, it's it's a it's an awesome, awesome experience. And like I said, that's I really enjoy that part of my job is just being like I'm a I don't know like I'm a local celebrity, I guess you could say. Let's <laughs> keep <laughs> <laughs> that way. Thank um, well, thanks for coming to talk to us. It's uh, um, you know it's a new position, so I'm just curious how this year as the SRO officer is different from years in the past when you've been coming to school, yeah, so before, and how you would define that before difference. Before my, my schedule, I work, I, I, for five years I worked Monday through Friday, um, seven a.m. to three p.m. But Mondays I have cover the road, so I'm patrolling, so I'm answering calls. I was still trying to make it part of my day to go to the schools but sometimes I couldn't. And if someone were to call off on day shift, like because we have two patrolmen at all times working the road, if someone were to call off, I would cover that position. So, and I couldn't make a schedule. Like if say someone needed me, say like um, I do health class presentations at the high school, um, she would ask, Ms. Carrera would be like, hey, can you, can, can you help out with the presentation? I could say yes, but if I get a call, I have to leave, like I can't, I couldn't guarantee me being there. So it was hard for me to make appointments because I couldn't say, like, yes, I'll be there. And then I'm like, oh, I can't because I get a call and stuff like that. So that has changed that now that I'm in the school and if someone takes off on day shift, they don't pull me. They'll either fill it with overtime or someone else will take it. So I can do my job. So is it fair to say that the differences are that you're just in the schools all the time? and that you're able to commit more to some of the education and the teaching of the students in certain programs or presentations. 100%. Just like because that. of that yes, presence. That, like now I have like a, You can be like, fully committed. I, I was, I've had a, the position kind of for five years, but this year they gave me the advisory group because I Got can it. be there. Mm -hmm. so. And so do you feel like your relationships with the students, I know the kindergarten has always been fabulous, but do you feel like overall the, the relationships with the students in general is better, more improved, more enhanced since you're there 
full time and that the relationships that you're building are stronger because you're an SRO officer? I, I think so. So just the other day, not to get into detail, but there was an issue that happened outside of school mm -hmm. that involved students. And students came to me to speak about what had happened um, before they wouldn't have done that. They wouldn't have, because they wouldn't know where I was at, they would just either kept it to this out or told somebody else, but they, they, they were comfortable enough and knew me well enough that they, know I would, they knew I wasn't gonna overreact or, you know. So they came to me and they came to my office and we had a conversation and we fixed what, what the issue was and everything worked out. And I feel like if I wasn't, if they didn't have the opportunity to know me and to see me in the schools, I don't think that would happen. And so that's, I mean. It sounds like there's trust. There's a built trust. I think so. I th and I think the more kids get to know me, the more they will trust and the more they, they see that I'm not, I'm not going to say a typical cop, but I'm, I'm a cop, you know, like they, it's, it's easier to have a conversation. Well, thank you. Elizabeth? So a couple of things. Um, there were some, I think, town councilors in particular that were concerned that having a, you know, an SRO would mean introducing the juvenile justice system into the schools, and um, it's really clear that that's not your role and not what you want your role to be. And so I think um, going forward, when we um, report out in budget process, when we talk about you know new programs and how they're doing, I think that's one thing that we want to talk about is that having Officer Dave in there on a regular basis is trust building, relationship building, educating, and that sort of thing. It's not you know trying to get more kids into the juvenile justice system. But um, so I have a question which is around um, emergency preparedness at the building level or the district level. Are you involved in that at all? Yes, we have, well, almost, we do monthly meetings, but almost weekly meetings, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so I'm involved in the, in the emergency plan. Um, done many training with like outside agencies and we do, as police officers, we do our own training and things like that, but we've uh, gone to Alice training, I've done the SRO training, the um, NASRO, National Association of School Resource Officers. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like I've been we've been plugging along, getting better at the at the um, emergency uh, planning meetings. Thank you, John. Just two two quick things. One of which is. I, I think that when we sort of start to look at your impact, it's really looking at your impact sort of overall with the high school administrative team and sort of what you're looking at in terms of how that's measurable in terms of what they have reportable all the way along. It's not just what you, you're just sort of part of that now expanded team that sort of addresses, like you said, some of these incidents that you wouldn't ordinarily hear about before this sort of happened. Um, so um, it sounds like it's working right on track, and I'm delighted to hear that. But I'm sort of thinking, as we think about how we're reporting on this, that's really the level, is sort of that school administrative team level that we want to be looking at what the the data and, and the impacts um, would be. And then just before before you wrap up, just sort of to recognize your sort of local celebrity status and take advantage of your public appearance here. I just wanted to make sure that for those people who are running town and school events who have a dunk tank, that you might be available for them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was trying to get a dunk tank for Family Fun Day. Like, I wanted to do it because, like, what kid would want to dunk a coffin in me? So I was like, that'd be awesome. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I am 100% down for that. Like it's, we appreciate your service. Here yeah, we have ice water. What was that? <laughs> ice water you had to too. Yes. Um, I just wanted to share with the um, board um, and also with you, Officer Galvin, an email from John Holdridge, who, is, who couldn't be here tonight, but he wanted to share his thoughts since you both are sharing an advisory class together, and I assume they're freshmen? Yes. Yeah, okay. So it says, um, I've known Dave since he started working in the schools a few years ago and was delighted to find out in September that not only would he be our full-time SRO, but that he and I would be sharing an advisory. I just wanted to say that it is a pleasure to be working with Dave as a co-advisor and to be able to cross paths on a daily basis. 
Dave might be considered a police officer first, but he is also an educator and a fine one at that. He has the ability to talk about serious issues with students as well as the ability to build relationships with students and staff through casual interaction. If building relationships is one of the objectives with the SRO, which it is, then I think it can be said that Dave is exceeding that objective. I look forward to many years of working together. Um, and then, so I, I thought that was just a really beautiful email to share and wanted you to hear it as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just thought maybe this would be a great opportunity for you to give us an update on, you mentioned there's a new chief. I, I knew that there is, but I don't know any details about when or who. And um, a new officer was going to be brought on board eventually, I thought, because you're in this position. Is that? Well, so our chief, Neil Williams, is retiring. Mm -hmm. He retires, I think, December is the last He'll, he'll be gone, and he's been working for the town for like 40 years or something right. like that, so he's been the chief for 20-something years. Um, so Sergeant Paul Fenton got the chief's job. Okay. So he's been working for the town for maybe almost 20 years. Okay. Um, and so he's going to be the new chief, and we, we hired an officer. His name is Ryan Wagner, and he's from Farmington, and he, he was hired because my position in the SRO, we created a new position. So uh, he, he's uh, working. He's been in the schools. I've shown him around because he wants to uh, wants to know where he works in the community. So every once in a while he walks to school, schools with me. Um, he used to work in Farmington, and he worked at the University of Farmington. He worked there as well. Um, and so because Paul is got the chief job, Paul Fenton, sorry, Paul Fenton is now going to be the new chief. That creates another position. So there's going to we're going to have to hire another, another officer yep. because. Chief Williams is leaving. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Thanks to, for, for being here tonight. Yeah. Any questions? Do you guys have questions? Here's all set. Um, yes, you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to um, item six administrative reports from principals first. Just <laughs> Good evening. Tough act to follow. I always seem to be following <laughs> tough acts. So um, just to kind of continue that discussion for a moment um, from the elementary perspective, um, when I knew that David would be the resource officer, um, even though I knew he would be focusing more on the schools, I was a little um, concerned that possibly he'd be focusing so much at the high school that I wouldn't see him as, as much. And I'm really pleased to say that that hasn't been the case and he's been around a lot. And um, it was interesting, Elizabeth, you mentioned about some public fears about the role of that, uh, the person in that position. And it's very much the opposite. It's very much preventative, positive teaching. So I've, I agree with you that we need to kind of continue to voice that. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I will try to be brief tonight. A couple of things I wanted to talk about. Um, I went on a little field trip today and I wanted to tell you why. It was a really special trip. We, uh, with the help of our parents association um, who ran our book fair this year, we were able to donate $600 to a charity of choice. And we chose to donate $600 worth of books to the Center for Grieving Children in Portland. I'm not sure if, um, Many of you are aware of, of that uh, organization, but it's amazing. Uh, it's a, it's um, run um, primarily, not, not entirely, but primarily by volunteers doing kind of the, the hands-on work with, with children and families who are going through crisis, who are really struggling, having a hard time. Uh, I was, felt very lucky to go deliver books today, uh, get a tour, and learn a little bit more about what they do and about the volunteer opportunities they have. It was just an amazing experience and just really gave me a lot of perspective this morning. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, our uh, Heather Reeves was a parent who really headed up the book fair this year and made the arrangements to travel to the Center for Grieving Children today and donate the book. So I thank her very much as well. It's a great morning. 
I wanted to just spend a moment talking about um, some of the happenings around Pond Cove, primarily around um, our performance evaluation, performance growth system. So um, in, um, in the past, we would say the evaluation system. But the difference with this is it's really a growth model. And uh, we, we take advantage of that in many ways. So I think although it is a traditional evaluation system in some ways uh, where there are observations conducted by administrators and, and um, there is an evaluative piece, the heart of it is really the growth model. And so we have been, um, Mrs. Forey Pettit and I have been getting in lots of classrooms, doing lots of, uh, they're called mini observations, short observations. We do several of them, but they're short snapshots and uh, <laughs> learning a lot about teachers and kids through that process. Teachers are also engaged in the goal setting process right now. They've actually completed that. So they, they set professional goals and student um, data goals. And Sarah and I meet with every teacher individually to go over those and talk about how we can support them this year in those goals. So it's... Um, it's a, it's a system that includes structures that um, result in a lot of collaboration and, um, and a lot of opportunities for us to support teachers. Uh, the other piece that's happening now in the building are peer visits. It's another component to the evaluation process. And so it's uh, teachers observing colleagues. And it's really not, that's really not an evaluative piece. It's an expectation, but um, it's mostly just that the administration can support teachers in working closely with their colleagues and observing each other. So that's some of the exciting work going on around that. And I wanted to share that with you tonight. Um, and just finally, uh, I was in, uh, speaking of mini observations, I was in a kindergarten room this morning and um, I would urge anyone that hasn't had a chance to observe in a kindergarten room in the past five, even 10 years, um, it is, I always use kindergarten examples whenever I'm describing any type of best practice because they are just masters in, in demonstrating that with great clarity, uh, just clarity and expectations, prompting, follow through, um, just captivating, amazing. So. Um, that was kind of a great takeaway for me today, that observation in a kindergarten classroom. That's it. Any questions for me tonight on anything? I'm thrilled to hear. I was a volunteer at the Center for Grooming Children you for did. 10 years, and it's a fabulous organization. So very glad our books were there. Amazing. I just instantly wanted to be, I want to be involved, and I want to somehow get my own children to, to be involved in that somehow. So, yeah. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. I have no notes. I forgot them at home, so it's, you're going to get what I know. Um, a couple of things have been going on really well. Uh, some things that I'm pretty excited about at the middle school, where Jeff and Jason and I are all you know, knee deep in the evaluation and professional growth process, which is a series of many observations, goal setting. Um, but one of the things we were fortunate at the middle school to be able to try to focus on was the whole idea that Jason touched on of peer visits. Um, some places they were called peer observations, which had a tone of judgment to it. So um, I think last year, wisely as a district, we changed that language um, more to peer observations, because that's really what you're doing is um, going into a classroom and, and observing, and, and it's really a, a, a peer of your choosing. Um, so we're not forcing people into classrooms. Uh, so that I think that's a powerful statement, A, that somebody might invite you in to watch, or they may ask to go to your classroom. Um, so that was really one of our big goals. And to do that is, is a bigger deal, a bigger challenge than it may seem, because in order to get you out of your room, somebody has to be in your room, because the kids are still there. Uh, and then it's a challenge to really make it very powerful by doing it through planning periods and planning blocks because sometimes you're planning with the people that you may want to see. Uh, so that's, that's also another challenge. So this year I was fortunate to work with my new assistant principal to figure that out kind of early and it really became possible through the hiring of, of our social worker, the additional social worker that we hired. Um, because that has allowed us to really increase a guidance curriculum this year. All students are going to have guidance on a, on a pretty regular basis. And that's happening. It's harder than you think to make sure that a guidance counselor or a social worker, because we have both of our school counselors and our social worker are working 
you know, as a, as a group of three um, to provide these, these lessons. And part of that challenge is to make sure that you see all of the grade level before you move on to another grade level. So it might be over the course of two days or else you have one group on lesson one and one group on lesson four and it just, it gets to be a pretty confusing thing. Um, we were able to figure that out in a very systematic way. So each of our content teachers are covered three times throughout the year. And that has allowed us to give those teachers the entire day to do a peer visit. So through planning, it means that if, if my kids are leaving me for the day, they're going to guidance lessons all day long. And in the middle school, different than the elementary schools, obviously you have different groups of kids. It's not one group all day getting guidance. Um, so as they would rotate through, that works really well. What that allows for is A, we're not getting a sub to cover them for a day, which would be very expensive to the tune of thousands of dollars before the year was complete to accomplish what we're accomplishing. Um, it also gives the teachers, they're not feeling like they're, they're needing to create sub plans. There's no sub plans, that's off their plate because the students are, are engaged in their guidance curriculum. Um, and it allows teachers to go off site. So if something really cool is happening at Lincoln Middle School, their teachers can arrange visits and go there. If it's happening anywhere around that somebody, they know that there's a colleague somewhere that's doing something that they wish we, we would know more about, they're able to do that. So that has worked to be really, really encouraging and powerful. We've had teachers going up to the high school. Um, my hope is we're gonna get teachers to go to the fourth grade, third grade. I think that this is a really strong opportunity to um, without any cost to the district, get really serious professional development opportunities for our teachers. Uh, and they are, they, are to they are loving it. And they're, I think at first they were a little nervous, but now they're feeling like this really happens. I, I do not have to worry about attendance or you know, my win in the middle of the day because in the middle of the day, we, at first they were gonna have to cover their win period still. Um, and then we're like, wait a minute, that kind of destroys the whole flow of the day. So we've been able to work it out. So kids, when it's your day to have guidance, you also get an extra phys ed period that day because it's kind of, you know, you, it's a weird day for them. And I think more time in a physical activity is good. So they're gaining an extra phys ed period when they're having that guidance lesson. So uh, I think by all accounts, that's really working out to be quite successful. And it's just a kind of a unique part that I think people struggle to figure out a way to do that could not have happened without the additional um, social worker position. Just wouldn't have been able to do it. So that's been one thing that's awesome. Uh, the other part that I, I was really excited about was on the 6th, we had the teacher workshop day, and it took a little while of planning ahead, but our, uh, actually Sarah Hansen, the new social worker, has a passion for executive functioning skills um, and teaching them. So she worked for a few weeks ahead of time to plan a, good, a nice day for our staff, a morning, where she was tapping into staff, research, staff members that felt particularly strong in an area regarding executive functioning. They made a presentation and staff was able to go from room to room to room to see and, and to learn from each other uh, what's going on and, and how it's helping kids. So that ended up being a tremendous morning. Um, in the afternoon we had Sarah Needleman from USM was here who's doing a class, um, a proficiency class, and she was talking about common assessments and kind of working with the range of, of comfort that our teachers have with that. So that was really actually a great day. Um, but it was nice to see our teachers actually having the time and the opportunity to work with each other and build off skills. They were able to find, oh, you're good at that? Ah, I'm gonna come see you now. But before they kind of, those connections are hard to make. So, so that's just a little bit of what's going on. Um, I have a question about the peer visits. Um, I think it's fabulous, bravo. Um, and bravo to the creativity of how you made it happen. Uh, are they always going off-site, or do they sometimes stay within the district and say, hey, I'm a Spanish teacher, there's a Spanish teacher over there, I want to learn from them, because I yep. think they've got great skills and I want to partner with them. So, totally teacher choice. Um, I just asked them that I, they talk to me the, before their day, so I know where they're going and what they're doing, uh, and then at staff meetings they come back and report out. 
some of the things they're seeing. So it's up to them. Um, Susan Dana just left. She went to Wayne Fleet because of a connection she had at Wayne Fleet in the morning. And then she came, I think she went to the high school in the afternoon. Um, I know Steve Price got a chance to go actually sit in on some high school chemistry and physics classes. So it's, it's kind of a hodgepodge of all that stuff. Um, and it's really encouraging them to, to seek out what they think they need and then do it. Yeah, I also, I, I think it's all great, but I would just like to, I don't know if you want to encourage the teachers, but there's a wealth of, I mean, there's amazing teachers right here in our district. And I think sometimes there's this idea that you have to go elsewhere to, to find inspiration. And um, that's not always the case. And if yeah. we just like, like what you said about the executive functioning skills, they, they learned in that day, uh, professional development day or teacher day, you call it, that, um, oh, you're good at that. I didn't know that. Now I'm going to come to you. Like, we can teach each other within. I, I, I just think it's great to be able to do both. And I know you can't, I, I think one of the, uh, one of the benefits of how this is unfolding for you is that teachers have their choice. So I think that's great. But well, and it's I'm more than one day. Putting it out there that I think. Yeah, and it's there's a and lot it's, of choices within the district as well. It's about three about. days for each of them. Yeah. So, I mean, clearly they're going to be in-house some. But one of the cool things there was a teacher that was kind of apprehensive. She's been here for a while, um, years, and. And also, she's like, came back to me so pumped up, and she's like, I didn't, I've seen this person, and I know that he's a coworker, but he's on a different grade level, and I don't really get to know him, and so I just asked if I could go in his room, and oh my goodness, he's so good at this and this, and, and then he came back in her room. So it's building also that sense of community yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Did you just say, um, well, I guess my question is, is it uh, optional, or did you just say that they have to do this three times a year? Not optional. Not optional, um, okay. So not optional, but they have. Everybody is responsible for one write-up of it as part of their of part of the evaluation plan. So it could be it, that could range. I don't think it ever is stated. It just says they're all they're all required, not just my staff, but all staff, um, to do a peer visit. So they're just getting to do three of them, and they have to choose to write up that experience. I, I think it's fabulous too, and I I, I think it's just a, the, such a easy way to get self-inspired. It's power empowering of our, of our own school. Mm -hmm. Every time you leave your district, you always find something you like somewhere else, but you start to realize how much you like what you have. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I would just second all that at the parent conferences and the open houses. There is just a, a lot of enthusiasm um, I heard from the teachers and a uh, great way to, to inspire right. Build at it. no cost. And, Thanks. Since you did a great job, I'll give you another challenge. <laughs> it would be great. I know it's not possible. There's a lot of complexity involved in ratio, number ratio wise. We would love to see students stand up and teach as well, if that's possible, given that role play too. Perfect. I think it's all about creating a safe environment where teachers are good with that, taking that risk to doing it a little different and having kids feel like that. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Charlie. Thank you. <laughs> so just uh, a few topics, just quickly. One is just to add a couple perspectives about uh, the school resource officer position. Um, David is a little bit humble in terms of some of the things that he does. Um, um, and for example, just the other, last week, um, he was sort of Nate Carpenter had an issue that was brought to him by some parents. The parents were having a concern about some issues between their students. So Nate and David Galvin just sat down with the students and just sort of did a mediation. It wasn't David in his role as police officer, although there were some questions that came up from the students about you know, what would happen if, if we went the next step, the next step. So that's really helpful. Um, and my understanding is the students walked away quite informed. Um, and. And, and Nate walked away very encouraged that there will not be any repeats of whatever was happening between them. They, again, it was something happening off school grounds. It was largely social media driven. Um, I don't know the details. Um, then I will say, this is one that I do know a little bit about, is that early in the year, a student made a bad choice. Um, it could have been something that was treated legally, but it wasn't. And David, I didn't even bring David into it because there wasn't the need to. Uh, but it was so nice to have him in the building where I could say, get to know this kid. 
after the fact. Not, not for the purposes of doing anything legally, but just to get to know that student. And he has done that, and it's been really helpful. I will also say last year the New York Times published wide and far that there was vaping at Cape Elizabeth High School in our bathrooms <laughs> and that sort of thing. Um, and I don't, and it mostly was in boys' bathrooms, so I don't know if Julia and Piper have a perspective on this. Uh, but this year, there's been almost none. Um, wow. And so that's really been nice. And one of those is, you know, when Nasir asked David what's his typical schedule, the wonderful thing that we have with him is a person who doesn't have a schedule to be in a particular time at a particular place. So he does roam around the building. He goes into bathrooms. He doesn't play the heavy, but just to be a presence and just to let the kids know that he's around and, and about. Um, so that's really cool. He is also frequently, I'm not sure if it's every day, but frequently you'll see him out in front of the school greeting kids as they come. Um, and his being in the cafeteria during lunch duty also is, it's really not about policing the cafeteria, it's really about getting to know kids, because that's when kids have their own unstructured time, and so he can introduce themselves and have an opportunity to interact with a bunch of students. Um, he's made a really big, huge difference, and you know, an SRO can be successful or not, depending on the personality of the person who, and, the, and the mission that the person has in mind. And he's just perfect for this role. Um, so, so that's that. And then I wanted to mention TEDx. Julian Piper mentioned it. Um, so we are having our fourth TEDx event on December 7th. Um, the first one was six years ago. Uh, it starts at, they start at 8.05, and uh, the last session is scheduled to end at 1.30, I think. I think all board members should have received an invitation to attend. And if, I know that's hard for people who work, but if there's any possibility, I would encourage you to do it. Um, the last session is scheduled to begin at noon and end at 1.30, and that's the session that traditionally ends with our student speaker, um, who is a secret, um, and, and will remain a secret, we hope. Um, I will tell you that back in 2014, a student named Hunter Kent spoke. And if you go you Google Cape Elizabeth High School TEDx Hunter Kent, you will see that the video of her talk um, in our auditorium has garnered almost 800,000 views on YouTube. Um, two years before that, the first Piper I ever knew, this is the first time I knew of Piper as a first name, Piper Otterbein um, spoke and her YouTube video has, has gotten about 400,000 views the last time I looked at it. Um, it's really professionally done. Um, all the speakers work with a professional speech coach in Portland. Um, if they haven't previously delivered a TED talk and that includes the student speakers, there are student performers, there's going to be at least a one alumni speaker. There may be two, um, I can't remember, but we have alumni come back as well. And then there's outside speakers who have no direct connection with Cape Elizabeth High School at all. Um, it's a pretty cool event. It's for juniors and seniors, so juniors and seniors will be in the auditorium. Um, ninth and 10th graders do not participate in it. They have the opportunity once in a high school career, and that has to do with a number of things, largely just the seating capacity in the auditorium given the fact that we want to invite members of the public as well. Also, because quite frankly, the attention span, it takes some attention, um, and so the attention of, of 11th and 12th graders is a little bit better, plus also, frankly, it makes it a bit of a privilege. Okay, this is something for juniors and seniors, something to look forward to in their experience. And it gets broadcasted to the underclassmen. Well, we're not going to do oh, that this year. Um, we are not going to do that this year. Interesting. So if we've done, we've involved underclassmen in a number of, in every year it's in a slightly different way. Um, this, the reaction to the live streaming the last time was that for some students it was really good, but there was a lot of missed, a lot of, it's hard to pay attention. It's one thing to yeah. be in the auditorium, it's a very different thing to see something on a screen. Um, so there is gonna be some live streaming where it's available, but it's not, we're not gonna be live streaming to every single ninth and 10th grader. The attention That's, span was yeah. It is being recorded, right? I'm sorry? It is being recorded. It will be recorded. It is recorded, yes. Yeah. Yes, and yeah, all of the all the videos will be available on YouTube. They're professionally produced, um, so you'll be able to see every single one. And I, when, when those go up on YouTube, I'll send out a link to parents for people who can't make it or staff members who can't make it. 
um, so they can see that. So that's TEDx. If you can possibly come to some part of it, I think you would be, you'll be impressed. Um, so I will just add on to the evaluation system. We do, the, the mini observation piece really has three parts. One is the mini observation. The second one, which is important. The second one, which I think is even more important, frankly, is the debrief conversation afterwards, which is usually within 48 hours afterwards. The third part is just a documentation piece in, in a program called um, TeachPoint. Um, I, I, teachers are really open to having administrators come into their classrooms, um, and I think it creates great conversations, it builds relationships, um, and as those relationships harden and solidify, it allows people to really have candid conversations about things that can stand to be improved. But it's that fact of coming in repeatedly that really builds the comfort level and the safety to accept that. Um, today I was in Mr. Rio's pre-calculus class. Um, he told the kids in this pre-calculus, they were talking about polynomial something. <laughs> Functions, I think polynomial. Yeah, polynomial functions. Okay, are you in that class? Not in <laughs> Polynomial functions, and I heard Mr. Rio at an appropriate moment. I don't think he had planned this. He said, "I'm going to tell you my best math joke of the year." Um, it was horrible, um, predictably. Most math jokes are, but it got the kids. The kids laughed. Um, it, it was also some good instruction that took place. <laughs> I was in Mark Ash's um, honors government class today. The students are turning in a research paper about the election of 2016 on Thursday and I'm analyzing whether it was a critical election as the students have studied critical elections. Um, and Mark was prepping them with a conversation about plagiarism, anticipation not only of this paper but also college. It was the most passionate conversation I've ever heard students, any teachers and students have about plagiarism. And he had given students some exercises about is this plagiarism, is this plagiarism, is this plagiarism. It was a really valuable um, opportunity. And then I was in Sean Garrett's class today. He's a physics teacher. I went into his AP physics class. Um, and he is adopting, um, he's doing a very significant revision of that curriculum this year. Um, and so he's adopting some of the approaches that, that have been used for quite a few years in our physics classrooms called modeling, one of the features of which is student whiteboarding and presentations in front of the class and that sort of thing. So he was working on electrostatics today and tomorrow I'm going to go in because he said the kids are going to be whiteboarding and doing some presentations, so that's going to be really neat. Um, is there anything else I wanted to say about evaluations? I don't think so. But so Nate Carpenter and I are both sort of sharing in that responsibility. Nate works with the special ed department and he works with all of the ed techs in the school and I do pretty much everybody else. It's a lot of fun. It's the best part of my day. Um, if I leave the school and haven't been able to fit in any observations, which has been rare this year, that's a bad day for me because it's the best part of the job without any question. Will you remind me, Jeff, um, how many mini observations you're supposed to have per teacher per that cycle? Or? So Kathy Stankard will correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I'm I both. Going to be talking about it. Oh, Kathy's okay, going to be. Okay. Well, never mind. You can never mind. Compare my answer to hers. Okay. So I think. <laughs> okay. I think that for probationary teachers, it's. It's six, I think. It may, be five six. it may be five or six, maybe guaranteed five. And then for continuing contract teachers, I'm pretty sure it's five, five in a year. Is that roughly correct? <laughs> Is it six? Anyway, okay. I think it's. Is that what it is? Kathy will tell you what it is, okay. but it's roughly that. <laughs> it came close. And the goal, the goal is obviously to do more, but it's if right. we can get to that point, then that. that yeah, I just wasn't sure what the what the number settled on. So, yep. all right. Obviously, I'm not entirely sure either, but <laughs> I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. just glad they're happening. I'm okay wherever. So I'm glad they're happening. Else. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Director of Special Services, Dell, do you want to come up? 
Hello, good evening. Hi. Um, I just wanted to share about some of the professional development that we've been doing in uh, special education. This past week on November 6th, I had the opportunity to meet with the related service providers, and by that terminology, I mean the OTs, PTs, social workers, psychologists, behavior specialist, anyone who was not a special education teacher. Um, and in the morning we worked on uh, researching professional sp uh, profession specific uh, performance rubrics um, that we're working on uh, getting approved so that they will be following uh, the professional standards for the practice that they're doing versus just following the teacher's rubric. We also followed that by doing some calibration work on writing measurable present levels of performance and goals. And in the afternoon, I was fortunate enough to be able to meet with the high school special education team to discuss transition plans and review the recent feedback from DOE on a sampling of transition plans for the upcoming audit that we're doing this year, the special education audit. Uh, several of the administrators and counselors last week also attended um, the first of a three-part training for identifying, developing, and maintaining 504 plans. It was put on through uh, a webinar by Drummond and Woodson. Um, all three schools, special education teams have been working with central office to prepare for this year's special education audit. And some of that has to do with the high school's been working on transition plans. Um, and everyone else has been working on um, the files that we'll be using for our uh, self-assessment. Um, as far as staff evaluations, the first round of observations of special education staff have been completed at Pond Cove and initiated at the middle school, so I've been able to do many observations of all of the staff at Pond Cove and have started at the middle school and I'm basically rotating around. So once I complete all of the staff at middle school, then I would head to high school and then start again. So it's a, it's a shared process with the building administrators. And so when the, the professional staff have summatives, we'll do it in a collaborative way. Um, staff are working on wrapping up their SMART goals. Um, recently, I, um, also worked on establishing regular meetings with building administrators to help support them, the staff, and the students. Currently, we're servicing 161 students in special ed, and that's 59 at Pond Cove, 51 at Middle, and 51 at High School. And we have 24 students in referral and two out-of-district placements. Any questions? When's the audit? Um, so it's kind of a year-long process, so by the end of this month, we'll be sending in our self-assessments. Um, then we will be sending out parent um, surveys, and then they actually show up in person, the, uh, the monitoring team, on March 12th. Okay. Um, well, good luck getting ready for that. Thank you. Uh, I would, you mentioned um, the transition, um, senior transition plans uh, at, at some point after March 12th. I would love to hear more about that. I'm just curious what is available and how it's handled. Um, just just yes. put in the back of your head. And there's, there's, and there's quite, a, quite a bit to it. And uh, I would love to have some of the experts at the high school, because we have a very strong team at the high school. Maybe have one of those folks, or two of those folks join me with that presentation. But uh, yeah, it's, they're doing a lot of great work down there. That's great. Thank you. Yes. Oh, John? Yeah, to, to Couple of quick clarifications. One of which is the the audit is, is is a periodic thing that happens on a regular basis, and this is just our time. That's right. To, it's to, be, to clarify a, for anyone who's yeah, watching, it's on a cycle. We're, 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 <laughs> and it's on a cycle. This and is our our numbers up. Our, yeah, this, this is this is this is our turn. It's nothing unusual. Um, and I wanted to also just ap applaud focusing on, on writing present levels of performance. I think people who don't know what that is, that's describing carefully where the student is currently at 
and it's what you measure against and set goals against, so the precision in that is actually really critical to making adequate progress. I appreciate that that's where you're focusing. Similarly, on transition plans, those are the plans that are made for how a special ed student will transition from high school to the world beyond high school, and there's the, the last, they begin, I think, um, fairly early on. Um, yes, uh, generally yeah. in, the, yeah. in ninth grade. At the beginning, yeah, and, and become more intense, and, yeah, more they're, broader they're, as, they're living as, document they, as they, they get older. Evolve but as well. again, that's, those are really critical aspects. Both of those two things, I appreciate the focus there. Those are really critical to our su student success, so Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you, John. Any other questions? Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> so Donna asked me to provide the big picture um, of our performance evaluation and professional growth plan. And you've heard a lot of bits and pieces. I'm just going to fill in the gaps. And if you have any questions, I'll answer them. I, I think I should begin by saying that Troy was right and Jeff was right. It's uh, for, for continuing contract teachers, a minimum of five mini observations each year. And for probationary teachers, it's six uh, mini observations a year. So, but um, I'll, I'll start from the top. We are in the second year of full implementation of our PEPG plan. Um, this provides for um, an annual evaluation cycle for probationary educators and a three-year evaluation cycle for continuing contract educators. Um, and the components of that are goal setting. Educators set two different types of goals. They set a professional learning and growth goal, which is about how they themselves following, assess, following a self-assessment and a conversation with their supervisor, how, what, what areas they want to focus on um, in terms of their practice. And then they set, and they do, they, they're required to set a minimum of one professional learning and growth goal for the three-year cycle. And then they set an annual student learning and growth goal, and that involves pre-assessing students, um, setting uh, a goal for them on the basis of those, the results of that pre-assessment, teaching them, and then uh, assessing and seeing what they learned. Then we have the mini observations, which you've heard about, and uh, as I said, uh, six for probationary educators and five for continuing contract educators. And then there is, as you heard, um, a minimum of one peer visit each year. And then um, in the middle of the three-year cycle, there's to be a mid-cycle evaluation conference. And since we're in the second year of full implementation, we're getting to the point where we're gonna start thinking about that. And, uh, and then there's a summative evaluation conference at the end of the three years, and it's at that time that the teachers will receive a, a summative rating, and that's required by statute. We are, as has been mentioned, we're using TeachPoint to track um, all of this, and it's been extremely valuable, um, and so much so that initially we had thought we would only have the teachers be in, in this software program, but we've since added ed techs. They have a different evaluation process, but it is also being um, tracked and reported inside of TeachPoint, and we've also decided to add, as Del mentioned, the related service providers and to put them <coughs> through the same process um, and into TeachPoint. Um, that is gonna mean different rubrics for them because the rubrics that, you, that we have for teachers just don't apply to our related services provider. And so we're gonna be bringing the steering committee together um, in December, December 13th, we're gonna be meeting um, the same group of teachers who've worked together for the last couple of years on um, initially designing. That was a slightly different committee, although I imagine a lot of the people overlap. That was before my time as stakeholder committee and then that was replaced by the steering committee whose job it is to revise the plan based on feedback. And so we're gonna be talking about um, the related service provider rubrics at that time. And I think that's it for EPEPG, unless you have any questions. You may have heard that um, our MEA data from last year has been released. We just got it today. Um, we um, were hoping to send the individual student reports out before the Thanksgiving break. They'll either be sent home um, in, in paper copies will be sent home or else our preference is to upload those ISRs into PowerSchool and have you access them that way. And then there will be a report on the data analysis forthcoming at some point. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy. Okay, next, Catherine. Hello, everybody. I will try to keep it short also. Um, my portion is always the biggest part of the packet, so that gives you plenty of reading time if you can't sleep tonight. Um, what I wanted to look, talk about quickly is the um, section, the one page section that's called, titled Budget Categories. It has the uh, 11 budget categories slash cost centers that the, is required under statute. And um, if you notice at the bottom of that page, we've uh, spent 33.62% of our budget. We are a third of the way through the fiscal year, so we're in pretty good shape. And another thing I wanted to point out is that during the summer, we spend a lot more in supplies and services to get ready for the school year. So in several different lines, we spent 60%. There are some lines we spent 90%. So the fact that we're at 33% currently is we're in good shape. So I just wanted to point that out to um, everybody on that. And if you have any questions about any particular lines or anything, please don't hesitate to ask me. I'm here to answer any questions you have. Um, so I was just gonna, that's all I want to talk about, the big page. The interfund summary page, um, that's still, as I said last time, it's, it's, it looks like this. It's after the computer printout. As I said last time, this format I'm using is what we've given to the auditors. This is what the auditors kind of set up. And I've talked to some of the administrators and it made me think, oh, this is a little too confusing still. So I'm still working on it, trying to make it easier for everybody to understand. So um, next month you'll see a little bit more of a breakdown where you can hopefully follow the numbers a little easier. So. I just want to let you know it's still a work in progress. We're trying to get it so people can read it easier and the information's there for you. So that's, that's what I've got for tonight. Any questions for Catherine? No. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. The girls need to go home and do some homework. Do you guys need to go home and do your homework? Or do you, are you, are you happy, happy to avoid it? Either way. Yeah. Well, always feel free that on a busy night to just let us know if you need to take off. So it's up to you tonight. Sounds good. Leave it a little bit. Okay. All right. You're going to stay? Okay. So next is Donna. So you have in your packet the enrollment report, uh, first of all. So the enrollment is currently down 21 students from this time last year and down four students. Um, from October's report. Up. Up four. Up four? Mm. Up four. Oh, sorry, up four. Up right. four. <laughs> sorry, John. Uh, up four, that's good, right? <laughs> Um, you have also have in your packet a draft re uh, budget <laughs> review schedule uh, for FY20. Uh, we were, are looking into changing some of the locations in order to provide better video coverage. Um, there's a, a bit of an issue with videotaping in the library. Um, so that may, may mean changing um, just a few of the dates. So we'll keep you posted on that. Um, administrators are working on developing their budgets in their areas based on the needs of their programs. The business manager and I will be meeting with administrators once their drafts are complete and we will also be meeting to discuss staffing and programming needs in the various areas. So we have a, an exciting foreign language opportunity and there is um, a paper in your packet about that. Um, the um, news release from the uh, Department of Education. Last week, Commissioner uh, of Education Robert Hassan announced a new opportunity called the Seal of Literacy that will be available to qualifying students upon graduation starting in June of 2019. Um, the announcement, again, is in your packet. The Seal of Biliteracy is an award given at graduation in recognition of students who have studied and attained a high degree of skill in English and at least one other language by high school graduation. 
So for the first time, Maine will be offer offering all students an opportunity to graduate with the SEAL. Uh, it's, the SEAL seeks to encourage students to pursue biliteracy, recognizes the positive cognitive and academic benefits of being bilingual, and can serve as evidence of academic and workplace readiness. Um, there are two, really, two pathways to earn the SEAL. Um, to qualify, all students must maintain a high degree of skill in their first language. So some students who have their first language as uh, English can earn the SEAL by attaining a high degree of skill in another language. And students whose first language is not English can earn the SEAL by attaining a high degree of skill in English. So that's an exciting opportunity. Uh, the DOE has published a list of acceptable measures of proficiency, and our foreign language teachers have begun discussions about um, proficiency measures that, that might be used in our district. So um, more word will come out on that, I'm sure. Um, evaluations, um, you've heard from the, the other district evaluators about their progress in the PE, PG system to date. And part of my responsibility is evalu evaluating minister, uh, administrators. And we have started that practice. I meet monthly with, um, with our building minister, and, uh, principals director of teaching and learning and the director of special services. Uh, these administrators have completed a self-assessment that's in alignment with the Marshall rubrics and are working on developing their goals and action steps based on those goals. Um, and these do focus on um, continuing their professional growth. So um, again, I will meet with them monthly to review their progress towards completing these goals um, as well as the work in the other domains of the rubric. And along the way, they'll be compi compiling evidence of the work in a portfolio which will either be um, electronic or on paper. So we are working on that. Um, just to keep you informed, um, tra transferring money um, uh, from Cape Coalition to Cape Olympians. So in your financials on the last page online, uh, 9982 and um, we're looking at 9982 and 9976. So on line 9982, you'll see $830 in the line for the Cape Coalition. This was an organization that was um, developed uh, way back. Um, it was set up to, as a co coalition to study and address substance abuse. Um, this was since taken over by community services and now it's no longer in existence. So we've been trying to look at our different funds and, and really clean out some of the lines that have been sitting idle for many years. Um, and so um, I would like you to be aware that we're planning to shift the, Cape, the money in the Cape Coalition line to fund the Cape Olympians, which is the special um, Olympic, uh, Olympics activities. Um, and that is on uh, line 9976. So I just wanted everybody to be aware that we're doing that rather than having that $830 just sit there forever and ever. So um, as long as no one has any uh, objections to that. Uh, we did hold the Combined Cape Elizabeth Town Council School Board meeting on October 23rd, 2018. Uh, the meeting was facilitate, facilitated by Craig Freshly, and discussion focused on creating a more collaborative FY20 budget process. You do have highlights, um, a highlights report in your packet that was um, developed by Craig. A general agreement at the end of the meeting was that there was a need for further discussion, so uh, we have been meeting, um, doing some planning, and the next meeting will be held at uh, 6.30 on December 17th. That's a tentative date that has to be approved by town council, so um, we tentatively scheduled it for December 17th. If that doesn't work out, we will let you know about a new date. Uh, I received a supportive email from a member of the community, which she has allowed me to pass on to you, so that is also in your packet. Um, I think people are um, really positive and supportive of um, the two, the town, the town council and um, the school board working together. So, any questions? Just, just a quick en enrollment note. So the four that we gathered, by the way, is is where we had seen less growth than we had expected, which is in those K through four 
Um, right. So normally you'll see significant growth in K through four, a little attrition in nine through 12, and the middle school sort of fairly flat. And so we're, so we're continuing to see those incoming classes grow, which is what we would expect if we're gonna stay flat. That's exciting news about the um, DOE, yes. uh, the seal, the yes. proficiency seal, yes. and um, since the senior, the current senior class is up for that, and I know you'll be informed at some point about the standards, um, the assessment that they're going to uh -huh. require. But that will be great, and I hope That's we exciting. are able to pass a lot of students. <laughs> The seal of literacy is just across the state, or is it across the nation? Across the state. Across the state. And this proficiency level in speaking, writing, reading, all of the above? Proficiency, you have to be, okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it says actually in the, the, the article from Maine DOE that it is in 38 states. But um, this is a Maine initiative. Right, it started in this California. is the first time we've had this in yeah. Maine, so yes. Mm -hmm. Is great. Okay, is that it for you? That's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to um, <laughs> old business. <laughs> um, I just uh, Heather and I attended a good night. Attended um, the main school business. Um, is that right? MSBA. Um, MSBA. MSBA, thank you. Uh, it was called the Drive-In Board Chair Workshop in Augusta um, uh, at the end of the month of October, and it was it was very informative. I've never been to anything like that. It was it was good to have some additional insight um, uh, to keep in mind, especially as the the chair um, and vice chair. Um, they provided specific information on the role of the chair for anybody who will be a future chair. Um, the, the roles being to be the planner, the organizer, the spoke pers spokesperson for the board, the delegator, liaison and confidant and caretaker of relationships between board members, <coughs> if that's ever an issue. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the one thing that came up that I thought was, uh, two things came up that I thought were worth repeating besides what I just said. Um, they talked about something called um, consent agendas, which is a way to save time so that you can leave more discussion for the, the more hearty, meaty, meaty things you want to talk about. So a consent agenda um, would include one um, action item of very standard things like minutes, um, any 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 hires that we don't need to discuss, um, any stipends, anything that's basically sort of a, an automatic, easy vote, we could put it all under one um, number. So we could have this consent agenda vote, and that would definitely save time and free up time for other things. I think that's something, John. So. When you do consent agendas like that, by the way, just so you know, if there's anything that gets included in the consent agenda that you want to break out, you can just make a motion exactly. to separate that item, and it goes back to the, the but it does save, can save a lot of time, so. Yeah. Yep. And it's, it, it's not set in stone, you can just motion, motion to split out items. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, and then uh, the other thing that was raised, and it's something we've talked about, but we have yet to do anything um, with, is effective boards will model self-evaluation. So that's something I would like us to do um, this year, is create a, an evaluation tool for ourselves um, to go forward with. And then lastly, this is an obvious one, but I think um, it, it also bears repeating, is that minutes, minutes that are included with our agendas um, every monthly meeting, um, are legally binding documents once they're approved. So it's really important to read over the minutes um, to make sure that it, in it is what you expect to um, approve. Um, and that, that's it. And then John, I, you attended um, a different conference and maybe you could give us a <coughs> synopsis of the, the items that you voted on for us. So uh, I was a, the delegate for the Maine School Board Association for Cape Elizabeth. They had a number of resolutions. It was actually quite a lively resolution session. There was quite a bit of discussion. I'll go through them briefly and I want to highlight a couple of items. Um, also just note that it, um, some of the items were not as we had actually discussed here. They were slightly amended and there, were, uh, there was one brand new item that we had not seen 
um, that ended up passing. So, for, ex um, for example, the, some of them were amended in the process, the, the, the move to, of, of child development services to the schools. Uh, many school boards had the same kind of problem we did about how the wording addressed uh, appropriately funded, um, and the wording that was approved was changed to be fully funded and as a separate line item from EPS to protect the existing budget structure and not essentially lay the child development services onto the school districts as part of an EPS where low receivers would then, even if they were fully funded, might not get a full, full percentage. Um, so the school safety passed without much comment. Uh, Gun-free schools passed without much comment. Uh, Proficiency-based diplomas. Um, there was a great deal of support and discussion around proficiency-based education, but not so much around diplomas, and this uh, did not succeed. It was not, it was not voted, uh, voted forward. There was a great deal of resistance also from people who were very vocal about local control. Um, but there was a lot of good support for proficiency-based education broadly. Um, part of the challenge was this was also put in the context of the most recent uh, actions in the legislature and there was concern that voting for this would be endorsing what the legislature had done around proficiency-based diplomas, which was not necessarily the case. And so it was turned down. Uh, special education reform was approved. Um, the starting teacher pay in longer school year this was a, actually was split into two resolutions and discussed separately rather than bundled together, and they were both defeated for different reasons, different groups supposing different ones. Um, school attendance at age five, again, this was slightly different than we considered it. It was actually uh, compulsory at age six, which we had had some support for, and recommended at age five was what was actually the resolution that went forward, and that actually did pass. Um, so it was slightly different than we had discussed where it was compulsory at age five, or which we did not have support. And then there was a final one that was added um, in just the, the few days beforehand by another school district, a uh, resolution to support uh, taking $30 million from the rainy day fund for school infrastructure uh, construction and maintenance projects, and that was approved. So, like I said, it was a very lively discussion. Um, we're not that far off from other people. I think there was also some general frustration from people I was talking with that wished, similarly wished they would address some of the structural issues in the state funding more forcefully as a school board association, um, but that, that was not the case. And there was some other good discussion with people from the main school board association about having them potentially act as facilitators uh, for school boards of impacted by the same issue, directly, directly lobbying legis legislators around, around funding and, and structural changes. So for example, going with uh, southern main districts, going with northern main districts who have similar problems, have similar issues. Um, and so there was some, some discussion around that that seemed like it might be proved fruit, fruitful in the future. So I can follow up with, with people who are interested in that. Thank you, John. Thanks for going. All right, next we have um, new business item seven. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the withdrawal of Cape Elizabeth High School from the National School Lunch Program. I second. Any discussion? Um, this is what we talked about at length tonight with Peter, and uh, I, I think it is uh, a, a really strong positive change that we're proposing um, that Peter's explained and so, all right. All those in favor? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, item eight, may I have a motion? I move we approve the following 2018-2019 administrative and athletic extracurricular personnel nominations as outlined in our packet. Do I need to reiterate what's not? Yes. As, as um, minus uh, Joey Doan Jr. in the middle school for the middle school indoor track assistant position for .50. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, next we have item nine, no vote required, but Elizabeth, do you mind just 
Uh, so in policy, we have been busy uh, making sure that we are bringing our policies into compliance, making sure that we have all policies that are required, bringing them up to date, that sort of thing. So um, in item nine, we have a first read and the majority of them are really um, bringing things into compliance with um, the most up-to-date language, whatever is um, required by state and federal standards. Um, but if you skip down to ADC, which is use of tobacco products and electronic nicotine delivery systems, um, this policy, um, the tweaks to this policy were brought to the attention of the board by high school nurse Deb Braxton. Um, in order to um, increase our visibility around um, electronic devices, you know, vaping and that sort of thing. Um, a, a few tweaks in the language allow us to have access to some signage around the entire school campus so that it's understood that um, this is a, you know, tobacco and um, nicotine delivery system free campus. It's not just in the buildings, at the football games, it's at the tennis courts, it's everywhere. Um, so really just kind of elevating our commitment to that. So that was that discussion. Um, oh, and I'm not gonna move to number 10 yet, so. I'd like to thank um, Deb Braxton in particular. I think she's been at almost every policy committee meeting since the beginning of the school year. But we also had um, Doug Worthley from the high school talk to us about chemical hazards. He is our uh, chemical, help me, Donna, does anybody? Uh, chemical hygiene officer. Chemical hygiene officer, yes. We have one of those and he's it. Um, and there's a very lengthy um, procedure that he has to go through in order to certify that all the chemicals that are used in the high school as far as the chem labs or the bio labs or that sort of thing are used appropriately, stored appropriately, disposed of appropriately, and the, and the students are educated to use them appropriately. It, it's a huge, huge job, and so we thank him for that. We thank him for um, this policy demands that we have a procedure. He brought the procedure with him. He was ready to go. So um, I, I show up to policy committee and all these people do the fantastic work and push us forward. So thank you to them. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to item 10. <coughs> now I have a motion. I move that we approve uh, the action to delete the following policies as presented. KLF Community Services Program, KLF R Community Services Program guidelines, and JLCCA AIDS HIV attendance policy. Second. Any discussion? These policies are being recommended for deletion. Um, the first two are because the um, relationship and responsibility between the school board and community services um, no longer exists as outlined in those policies. So they are extraneous. And then JLCA, JLCCA is completely outdated. And we have different policies that refer to what we legally need to do. That was recommended for deletion. Thank you. Any further discussion? No? All those in favor? Okay. Thank you. Question. Oh, you had a question? This is number. Am I allowed to backtrack and ask a question about something on number eight that we voted for? Or is discussion closed? It's kind of just a generic question. It's not like a doubting. I'm just curious if um, some of these uh, extracurricular, you know, it's the boys basketball, boys basketball, boys basketball. Is there, did we already vote in the girls basketball? It just seems odd to me that there's just boys and there's not girls mm -hmm. basketball. Do we know? I don't know. I would think I that feel like we saw some of them there. last month. Does anybody remember that? I mean, I can go home and look at it later, but. I can tell you. And, and I'm just curious why they came at different times. You yeah, have I, I believe we voted in. I think Mr. Kerr is 
It's already started. It's already yeah, it's already is that, started. Is that why the basketball schedule is so funky? That's why. The girls are early this year and the boys are late. Okay, that's why. There was a girls okay. game today, but I think we did. I remember seeing them on here. I think we that's did what I thought. Them. I was just confused, but okay, thank you. Sorry, and now I can next year see. the boys will be early and the girls will be late. The girls will be playing, playing, playing basketball. So. Oh, they are. They were already playing. Yeah, right? so. That's why. It's because the schedule is yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, moving on to 11 committee reports. We've heard from Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Unless you have anything to, else to add? No? Hope, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, nothing. The advisory committee meeting for PATS is Thursday morning of this week, so okay. I'll have a report next month. Great. Thank you. Now, sir, tech committee, any updates? Uh, no, I missed again another meeting, but the next one coming up is the December 5th, uh, 2 p.m. December 5th, 2 p.m. Yeah. Okay. May I make a suggestion? When, uh, Every year when we have technology discussions, um, people r would love to know how the teachers and the students feel about what they're using and what we're choosing to um, invest in. And I have firsthand feedback from a young high school student and the iPads that they're using, but it would be great if the technology committee wanted to do some surveying of teachers and students. I don't know what where we are in our um, lease and purchase cycle and all that sort of stuff, but when we make new decisions, it would be great to hear from people. Do you want to ask Noel about I that? Suggest that for the okay, analysis. great. Thank you. Um, the Town Comprehensive Planning Committee uh, is getting near the end. We had the third and final public forum on um, the end of October the 30th. Thank you, Kimberly, for coming. Um, it was really, really well attended by the high school uh, history honors uh, AP class by Mr. Jordan, which made it fun. Um, the draft now, the entire draft is online. Um, I would suggest anybody who hasn't looked at it to look at it specifically um, as regards to the schools. I would look at um, uh, what's it called, public facilities chapter. Um, and at the end of every chapter, just so you know, there are recommendations and goals. And if you know you don't want to read all the all the stuff in each chapter, you can go quit jump to the end and look directly at the um, goals and recommendations. And now is the time to make suggestions to the committee um, because once it goes to the town council, it's out of the committee's hand. That was going to be my question. If once re you know, is there an opportunity for comment now that there's a document? So yes, there is. There is an opportunity for sure. Okay. We've been trying to get as much input for the past two years, so mm -hmm. it's still time. <laughs> okay. Um, request for future school board meeting items. Um, I don't know that, I don't believe that my request raises to the level of a business meeting, but I think a discussion, um, going back to something Donna talked about as far as video recording, budget meetings and that sort of thing, um, I was very disappointed that the, um, the first meeting of the um, needs assessment committee was not able to be officially videotaped and so I think a, a discussion, it could be at a committee level or it doesn't even have to be a workshop, but um, the importance of um, people, it could be in our technology department, it could be that we have to farm it out through John Holdridge or Jana Dewan or something like that, but um, we really want to be transparent, we want to communicate, we want these meetings to go out to the public, so how, you know, how, how can we make sure that that happens um, so that we're not caught up short when we think somebody's coming and they're not or, um, you know, we have a tradition of having these meetings in, in the, the library. Everybody plans on these Tuesday nights and, and now we're hearing, oh, we might not be able to videotape, we'll have to change nights. And so how do we, how do we work through this? How do we, you know, how do we make it happen? I think that's a great suggestion, Elizabeth, and I think it could expand also to, um, you know, the, the the web web presence. And I know all this is going to involve money, but I, I feel, and also another point you made a while back about um, linking calendars, our calendar with the t the the town's calendar. Um, I think there's room for improvement even without spending um, hopefully too much money, but I, I think it's definitely a great agenda suggestion. And like I said, it doesn't have to be a business meeting. It could just 
you know, a, a, you know, a committee, a, a conversation, something. Thank you. Susanna? I, yeah, sorry. I know a lot of all of us here were at the um, needs assessment committee, but I don't know if we want to report out on that and right. or not. I don't. Yep. Um, you're right. We should report out on it. Uh, you, you, do you mentioned it right in your superintendent report? Um, you no, know, I mentioned the town council. Come on. Oh, okay. So you're right, Kimberly. Um, on November last week, Wednesday, we had our first of four. Um, Meetings of the Needs Assessment Committee, and it was it was very well attended, um, and we are in in conjunction with what we were just talking about, you know, having easier access to posting and communicating information. Um, we will eventually soon have a, a site um, dedicated to the committee where minutes will be posted. Um, any video footage or audio that we have, um, and I'm glad to say I have good audio. Video footage is not so great um, of the meeting, but of the tour, we have the tour video that will somehow post somewhere. Um, and uh, after, in the next couple days, you'll be receiving the minutes um, from the needs assessment. And. Uh, we focused on, uh, we met at the high school and we focused on the athletic um, department. Jeff Shedd and Jeff Thorak uh, provided the tour, um, basically showing the challenges um, present um, in the athletic department um, and safety issues related to those challenges. And then, Elizabeth? Oh, I was just going to say, I think it, it would bear noting that the board doesn't necessarily prioritize athletics or the physical education program, um, but due to scheduling conflicts, that's where we started. We believe that there are needs throughout the school department, so people shouldn't take any sort of uh, cue or you know inference from us starting with you know, the athletic department. Good point. Did you want to add anything, Kimberly, about the committee meeting? No, um, just maybe our future dates. Yeah, I was going to I was gonna get to that uh, at the end, but I can say it right now since we're talking, well, it's next anyway. Um, on our agenda, it says that the, it has uh, the meeting that just happened. So okay. the very next meeting um, is coming up on Wednesday, November 28th, and that will be at the Pond Cove, um, Middle School Cafetorium, and then the one the next week directly after that on Wednesday, December fifth, it will be at six thirty also at the high school, and then the fourth is scheduled for January 9th at six thirty. Location to be determined. And when you say the high school, do you mean the library? I mean the library. Yes. And then upcoming, other upcoming meetings. Um, as Donna mentioned, we are, we're going to use our, um, November workshop. Um, yeah. We're wondering if we could use our November 28th workshop to look at MEA data. Oh, okay. Um, and then we were going that's to. That's a good use, idea. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, that would be great. And we we don't normally have a workshop in December, but that's the date we're we're looking to use a date in December to have the, another joint. The seventeenth. Um, hopefully the seventeenth yeah, once it's approved, um, to have another joint um, meeting with the town council about budget related issues. Um, policy committee is November twenty seventh. Um, Always a blast. <laughs> um, I think that's it for future meetings. Um, before we adjourn, I, I this sort of sprang up on me uh, suddenly <laughs> without too much, um, I don't know, I think I'm still waiting for um, election results, but <laughs> I just want to say, John, this is your last official business meeting, which I can't stand, but um, I want to thank you so much for your, you know, your service here. I hope maybe you consider coming back at another point, um, but you've added so much. You've added this very unique um, perspective, um, insight, and questioning that um, I'd never on my own would have um, come up with. I think it's truly unique to your background. Um, I thank you so much for um, your, your, uh, 
fair-mindedness and your passion um, that you have clearly brought here to the um, school board and also to all the students um, of our district. And we're going to miss you. Thank you. You're not yet, John. You're Elizabeth. <laughs> I too wanted to thank you, John. I'm sorry to see you go from the school board. Um, it's been a pleasure to learn from you and to work with you. Um, you bring a fantastic perspective and what's wonderful about the school board is that although we are united in our goals, everybody comes at it a different way with um, different ideas, different insights. And I felt like your strength really was around helping us stay focused on, you know, how are we going to report what we're actually doing? How are we going to show that we've actually improved something? How are, you know, so I appreciate you helping us focus on that message. Um, I don't know what we're going to do with you during, but without you during budget season, but <laughs> maybe we'll see you in the audience. But again, thank you so much for your service. Um, Elizabeth kind of took the words out of my mouth that I was going to say. I think I will, for however long I'm on the school board, the next three years, I will constantly hear data reporting, and that will be the sweet little reminder of John in the back of my head to question that, to ask for that, to expect that um, as, as doing a good job. So thank you for teaching me that, for uh, bringing that to the board, and um, I hope that we can continue that work and that energy that you've really put yourself behind. So thank you. I would, I, I, I'm, we had been thinking that we still had you next month, so I'm <laughs> always caught off guard and totally disappointed. Um, I have so enjoyed working with you, John. You have so many strengths and um, you've given so much of yourself to the school board. Um, I feel like any, tasks that you take on, you you research thoroughly, you just you give 100% of yourself to things. And, um, and I'm going to really miss having you here. I, I think uh, you, you have great insight. Um, you follow things through to the end. Um, and I think you've been a real asset for the town here on our school board. And um, I'm sorry we won't be with you for the next, well, for me, the next year. I guess hopefully you can go last, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, John, I don't know you well, but I think you know me well enough. I enjoyed your passion. Um, you spoke from your heart. Your heart was into it. Uh, you show unique skills of, uh, of seeing the whole picture, not that tiny number you were seeing beyond that. Uh, I think you had a good perspective of comparable numbers across the councils and us. You were just excellent with numbering numbering and uh, I hope that we can do well without you uh, but we know where to find you at least I know where to find you <laughs> uh, but it's been a joy uh, working with you uh, on this school board thank you for your service I'll just add I my first year wouldn't have been quite as easy without you here <laughs> so thank you for your help and I expect you also to help continue going forward so expect a call from me <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. I'd just like to say um, a word of thanks to all my fellow board members, those who are serving currently and those who served before. It has been a great pleasure to be a member of the school board. Um, one of the things I've told people when I joined the school board is um, there's a lot more and a lot less there than you think there is. There's actually no very few more meetings than you see here in public. But the more that there is, is there's a sort of invisible structure and wisdom to the structure of how a group functions and how it has momentum and how it's able to carry through with the business of maintaining and having stewardship over what is really a great school system. And I've really appreciated how the board and all my fellow board members have come together and really worked very hard in a very collegial way under often very difficult changing circumstances um, to help uh, guide the school system forward for the betterment of the town and for the kids and for everyone involved in the district. So I really appreciate that. I feel very gratified now leaving the board feeling like the district is in 
better shape now than when I started, but that doesn't mean there isn't work to do. But I feel like everyone is headed in the right direction, and I really appreciate um, all of my board members are, and our new superintendent, and I look forward to working with you on the things that I do in the school system and in the town going forward. Thanks again so much. It's been my pleasure to serve with you. Thank you, John. Lastly, uh, number 14, may I have a motion? Go ahead, John. I, I move we adjourn. I have a second. <laughs> I have a second, Elizabeth. <coughs> All those, in, sorry, all those in favor? <laughs> all right, thank you.